All of life works on responsibility. Everybody listening to this program has achieved what they've achieved in life because they took responsibility to make it happen. Government's no different than that. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Philip K. Howard. He's the author most recently of The Rule of Nobody, Saving America from Dead Laws and Broken Government. Philip K. Howard, thanks for talking to Reason. Nice to be with you. All right. Well, let's get right to it. Uh, you know, what, when did uh, uh, The Death of Common Sense come out? 1995. Okay, so you know, you uh, basically 20 years ago, you helped launch a conversation about the rule of kind of top-down or automatic regulation in American life uh, of of politics on autopilot, and and we're still in the thick of this, uh, but it seems like your message might finally be getting through that we we need to really change things. In the rule of nobody, one of the things that you talk about again and again in compelling fashion are just these examples where. We don't even know who to turn to. The government doesn't even know who to turn to when they need to get things done. Talk a little bit about the Kill Van Cull, uh, which is one of the opening anecdotes of your right. book. So in, in, in 2008, uh, the Port Authority realized that uh, the new generation of ships, post Panamax ships, were not going to fit into Newark Harbor because uh, the main bridge they have to pass under, the Bayonne Bridge, was 65 feet too low. The bridge had been built 80 years ago. It's like the fourth largest single span mm -hmm. uh, bridge in the, you know, in the, in, in the world. Uh, so they uh, commissioned studies and the studies came back to, well, you need to build a new bridge, a new tunnel. It's gonna cost four or five billion dollars uh, to do this, but wreak environmental havoc on the communities and, and such. And it won't be finished in time for the new ships in any right. event. Um, you know, the, the environmental review wouldn't be done for a decade. Right. Um, and the person in charge of the project, a lifelong uh, Port Authority employee, said, well, is it possible that we could just raise the roadway within the existing 80-year-old bridge? And they sort of raised their eyebrows, and, oh, probably not, but we'll go look at it. A couple of months later, they came back, yes, we can. Not only can we raise the roadway within this existing single, single arch of the bridge, um, but we can use existing foundations that are structurally sound and not change the right of way. We just have to raise it a little bit. So it's like a miracle. Right. Instead of four or five billion, it was going to cost one billion dollars. And uh, you don't even have to rejigger everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing, nothing gets rejiggered. Right. It was just brilliant. It, it would be, and it should be ready in time for the post pandemic ships. That was 2009. In the middle of 2013, four years later, over four years later, uh, they were still arguing over how much environmental review was required. Mm -hmm. Groups had decided that this should be, they should study the effects of a more efficient port on the citizens right. of Newark, which is seven miles away. Right. Uh, had, no, had nothing to do with the environmental effects of the bridge itself, which is sort of what the law is intended to, right. <laughs> to, to protect against. Finally, it got approved over these objections, and of course, what's happened? They've started a lawsuit. So mm -hmm. now the lawsuit is pending. Right. And I mean, part of it is, that, I mean, the, the way you talk about it is that the people in charge of these operations don't even know who to turn to to expedite things or who's in charge. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that where there's this vast diffuse, I mean, there are, is a, a blanket of rules that cover every move. And then there's kind of a fog where you don't even know who is enforcing right. this rule or that rule. Right. So it's an environmental review in this country is a process. No one's in charge. Mm -hmm. And so the Port Authority said, okay, well, under the rules, we need a, quote, lead agency to, to, to oversee our environmental review of this, this project. Well, who's going to be the lead agency? Mm -hmm. Nobody in the federal government has the authority to do that. Right. So they send letters out to all these different agencies, and they drop out. And finally, a year later, uh, the Coast Guard is the last one standing, and they agree to be the lead agency. Then they have public meetings on, well, how much should we study? Again, no one's in charge of actually saying, well, how much did you study? So they have public meetings or arguments back and forth. That goes on for another year. Then they make a list of all the legal requirements that, that, of things that must be studied no matter what. Mm -hmm. And one of them is you have to do a survey of historic buildings within two miles of the, of the bridge. Well, 
the bridge isn't going to touch any historic right. buildings. It's but the same right away. But you still have to do that. But you still have yeah. to do it. The law yeah. says you have to do this. So they, then they have to go through a procurement process right. because it's the government, mm -hmm. which is its own neutral process to find a consultant to do the build, survey of historic buildings, which is completely unnecessary. That takes a year. And, and many more. Yeah. So uh, in, in a different context in the book, you talk about how the president and the executive branch, as the, as the head of the executive branch, doesn't really have very much authority over all of the agencies or personnel that he oversees. Talk a little bit about right. that. So at one point, the Regional Office of Environmental Protection Agency was making noises that maybe you need a full environmental review to study the effects on the citizens of Newark. Meanwhile, the president of the United States, President Obama, uh, issues a statement declaring this bridge is one of the top priorities mm -hmm. in the country to get done for the economy and for jobs right away. Mm -hmm. He issues this statement that this is going right. to be a top priority and two weeks later the regional office of EPA sends a letter to the Port Authority saying we're still not satisfied and we mm -hmm. think you should do a full-blown environmental review It'll take another right. five years. Well, who are they working for? Right. They supposedly work for the president. Who's in charge of this show? I mean, no one's in, no one's in charge. And so it's, it's, it's literally, it's a ship yeah. without a captain. And it's, you know, environmental rules are among the most kind of arcane and Byzantine. But it's, it's not just about, you know, it's not just green whack jobs. It's all aspects of kind of government uh, authority. Yes. And so, and so one of the things that I write about in the book is how the president of the United States actually doesn't have the authority yeah. To run the executive branch. He can't, except for a very small number of mm -hmm. appointees, he can't hire and fire who he wants. He can't really even tell people what to do because it's all kind of dictated by this accretion of law, um, which is built up to keep the analogy yeah. like sediment in the harbor. Right. And so it's this is a problem that's much worse now even than it was 20 years ago. And it'll be worse, even worse 20 years in the future. Oh, 20 years in the future. Yeah. I mean, we're already nearly paralyzed. Right. We won't be, right. be able to do anything. Uh, by the way, is this, this broadly uh, uh, observed throughout kind of advanced economies? Is this uh, just kind of like this stage of, uh, of liberal democracy? Uh, it's a problem in in most Western democracies, uh, but it's worse in our country than the other. Other countries have figured out ways to, to begin to deal with it by sunset laws or right. laws, things like that. Um, you know, another great example of kind of just insane regulation of minute things. Uh, talk about Kansas retirement homes. <laughs> so, so nursing homes in this country um, first, let, let me say, nursing homes require oversight. Right. You know, half the people have dementia. Mm -hmm. You don't want to put your granny or your parents right. in a nursing home that's abusive. So government oversight, I argue, is important for freedom at some level. But the way it works in this country is that most states have a thousand or more rules right. that say things like, Food must be stored no less than nine centimeters above a the floor. There should be trash cans in every wastebasket. You know, there, there should be eggs. Eggs must be cooked. Eggs must be cooked. Yeah. There should be 0 .09 recreational workers. Right. You know, per employee per some period of time. I mean, you know, it's 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 unbelievably uh, you call it micro regulation, mm -hmm. uh, and and nursing homes in this country are horrible. Mm -hmm. The people go through the day trying to comply. Inspectors come by periodically. They don't even try to evaluate whether it's a nice place mm -hmm. or they're kind to yeah. the residents. What they evaluate is whether all the boxes have been. Right. Or if the, and if the food is only six centimeters off the floor, yeah, we got to shut it down. Or, or, or you or, get a yeah, ticket. Yeah. 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 You know, in, in this final kind of instance of where it's not even clear who's running the show, uh, you talk about a, and I'm, I'm blanking now, it's a $50 million dollar uh, was it a, a reformatory or a prison or a right, former right, mental right, institution right. in New York State right. so that Andrew a, Cuomo <laughs> wanted to shut down? So, so when Andrew Cuomo got elected, uh, he, the, New York State, like all states, has significant budget problems in part because of the accretion of law and all the sort of pension benefits mm -hmm. and things that have kind of piled up over the years. And he discovered that there was this juvenile detention facility upstate that cost $50 million a year to run. Mm -hmm. And there were no juveniles in it. 
It was empty and it had no prospects of being used. Right. So he said, to say, well, this is easy. We're just going to shut this down. We're going to save $50 million right away. Right. Not so soon. It turns out that there's a law um, that requires that for any public facility with union employees, there has to be at least one year's notice before a facility can be shut down. So he wasn't allowed to shut it down. So the taxpayers had to pay another $50 million. Uh, I think that's 10,000 families paying each, $5,000 each extra in taxes that year to pay for a facility of no use whatsoever because of a law that's basically a kind of union feather bedding law. Um, Medicare's early days, you have, you know, we, everybody recognizes now or seems to recognize that Medicare, the federal government's uh, health care system for elderly people, the single payer system for elderly people is just, you know, one of the things that is beggaring the nation. Uh, you know, it's going to double in, in before 2040, it's going to double in the uh, number of enrollees. It's going to cost us more, uh, double the amount of money we're paying per person per year per enrollee. Um, you talk about the early days of Medicare, about how doctors and providers game the system to squeeze, kind of maximize money. Talk a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about where this kind of mentality comes from and how to address it. So, so Medicare was, was enacted in 1965. It, it actually, the bill was done over a weekend, the main bill, and they, and they copied an Aetna um, plan. And basically, it introduced the idea of government providing a kind of fee-for-service reimbursement to people taking care of the elderly. And, uh, and they had modeled a little bit the numbers of what it would cost based on existing cost of, of, of health care, and they had a certain numbers for it. And so the bill was enacted. A year later, the people who wrote the bill went out in the field to see how it was working. What they discovered is that all the cost modeling had been thrown out the window because doctors and hospitals had radically changed the way they practice medicine. They were now practicing medicine to maximize reimbursement, not, not surprisingly. So they discovered things like gang visits to nursing homes where doctors would go to a nursing home and you know, a whole row of, of experts and they would each see an elderly person and do an evaluation for a few minutes and then collect whatever the designated fee was for that. And uh, we're getting rich yeah. you know, off of this. And so they knew a year into it that this was going to turn into a budgetary nightmare. But in the culture of lawmaking in this country, nobody ever goes back and actually adapts or changes the law based on actual experience. And so yeah, now, 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 40, 50 yeah. years later, it's uh, on the verge of bankrupting the country. And it's, uh, we just recently, or Congress is recently discussing the next, what's called the doc fix, right. which is when there was a statute back in the late 90s, I guess, that said we're going to reduce the per fee rate right. for services. Congress always manages to pass a temporary bump up so right. that that day never comes. So right, 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 right. And so you have, uh, the, the dynamics of Washington is that every special interest sees its role is simply preserving its benefits. Mm -hmm. So no one can ever claw anything back. And what needs to happen is to abandon the fee-for-service model. Right. And by the way, people know this. It's not a surprise. I mean, even uh, the Affordable Care Act, so-called mm -hmm. Obamacare, has provisions in it that says we need to move to what they call integrated care providers, where doctors and hospitals will do everything required for a patient for a fixed annual fee right. rather than piling it up. And know, we can already piece. see well, you know, how you would game that because we've had experience with HMOs in the past, which one of the ways yeah. that you do that is you get the money and then you give out less service. That, 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 that's right. So you have to have a better accountability mechanism. Right. But the one thing, uh, well, two things that are needed. I mean, health care is hard because there's a kind of infinite demand mm -hmm. For the services, so so if there's not a market mechanism to right. deter use, and there's not an accountability mechanism to make sure that for, if it's a fixed fee, right. people are actually delivering the services, then there's a lot of room for well. Here's abuse. A, I mean, I guess this is implicit in what we're talking about, but you know, your book is focused on government because you know it's not that large corporations don't have 
bureaucratic nightmares and stupid rules that seemingly are issued by nobody but enforced by everyone or responsible to nobody. But it's the government. And how much of this is, is fundamentally a question of the public sector because the public sector is not spending its own money or it's not, you know, when you talk about what we need is a market, you know, if we had a market mechanism, why don't we have a market in healthcare, say? Right. Uh, well, it, it is a government problem. Corporations do lots of stupid things, yeah. but uh, sooner or later they fail. Right. And so it gets cleaned out. And, and, you, and you've seen that with lots of companies that just can't sustain their... Right. Their, their yeah, this is pattern, A&P, Western Union, IBM, or, yeah, yeah, or AT and yeah. T. They're either gone or a shadow of their former self because yeah. they're beholden, they're shackled by their own uh, right. uh, lassitude. And, and and the nice thing about corporations, they may have stupid rules, but you put a new person in charge, and they're in charge. Mm -hmm. They can change the rules. Right. Yeah, new boards, new shareholders, and you see lots of shareholder activism all the time. Mm -hmm. This sort of pushing companies to 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 do something that that if they didn't have that sort of uh, uh, pressure or accountability, right. they would not. Well, they would not. Yeah, it. and let's talk about this because in, in the book, in The Rule of Nobody, you talk about how under current orthodoxy, the ideal government runs like a software program. Input the facts and outcomes a decision. You write, this technocratic model of the rule of law has many plausible virtues. Government can't act arbitrarily uh, if, you know, if, if it's shackled by clear rules. Precision will offer predictability needed for citizens to plan their affairs. And it's unadulterated. This, the, this type of technocratic rule, the, the theory goes, is unadulterated by human judgment. But it comes at a cost. Um, right. Talk a little bit about where did the technocratic model come from? Why did, it, why did it kind of gain dominance or hegemony in the way that things are done? Well, it's an extremely good question yeah. because uh, it, it, having government that kind of works like a software program or automatic government appeals to everybody. It right. appeals to me. You know, who wants some official to have discretion right. to do something? You know, who knows what they might do? And this uh, includes, this is everything from a, a, a building permit, like you shouldn't have to, you know, kiss the ring of right. a building inspector or to just get a permit or a cop to get a gun permit. Or, I mean, you could multiply this sure, infinitely. Sure, at every right? level. Yeah. You know, teachers, uh, teacher authority, principal right. authority. and and the worse government works, the more distrust there is. Mm -hmm. Nobody trusts the teacher anymore, right. or the principal anymore, or the cop anymore. Right. So we try to put in more rules to make sure they do the right, right thing. The problem is it doesn't work. Right. It's, its appeal is undeniable. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. It's not predictable. Rule of law is supposed to be predictable. There are too many rules. Yeah. It's just not predictable. They, they end up contradicting each other. Nobody knows what they are. And so instead of supporting freedom, now, increasingly, people assume they can't do things. Mm -hmm. They assume they don't have freedom, so there must be a rule right. somewhere. There have been studies that confirm that. Teachers and principals don't act. They don't maintain order because mm -hmm. they assume they can't. Right. You know, that, that's well, and, and you tell a story about a teacher who starts at a school and they call, uh, they call up the maintenance person because the water, uh, the, the water fountain isn't working. Right. And they get chewed out for not following the proper way water to Water fountain re repair. Uh, right. Procedures. Yeah, you know who's going to go find the water fountain? Right. You know repair procedures. You know it's like nothing. Nothing is based on common sense. Nothing is based on the idea of what's the right thing to do. Right. Everything is what does the rule require. Well, you know it seems in in certain aspects of law or, or government, there is a pushback on this kind of te technocratic rule. I mean, uh, surprisingly to some. There's a, a number of kind of libertarian or conservative Republicans who are pushing back on mandatory minimum sentencing, right. which right. was enacted mm. precisely to say, OK, right. we're removing the judge's uh, latitude to make right. decisions here because, you know, that that's not right. The rule of law should be equal treatment for equal offenders. Right. Um, at the same time, and this, I guess, is a story that's in the news. There's a, a DuPont heir named Roger Richards IV who uh, was just he was found guilty of raping his children. Uh, but the judge uh, said, well, you know what, we're not going to give him jail time because he wouldn't fare well in prison. Isn't, I mean, this is, right. and I'm not asking you to comment on that particular case, right. but that's one of the places where these dictatorial rules come from, right? Because you don't want, well, because he's a Duponter, yeah. he can buy justice. Sure. You know, we want sure. equal laws applied to e equally to all people. So the ideal system of government, the ideal system of justice, is one that people reasonably trust. It's not one that guarantees the right result every time. 
It's one that people reasonably trust. And so if, if the ultimate purpose of law is to provide a framework for freedom so that people, when they go through the day, feel free to interact with others, um, both protected against abuse like fraud or theft mm -hmm. from others, and also reasonably confident that if they act reasonably, right. you know, they won't get in trouble. Right. And so we don't have that rule of law now. Government doesn't act that way, and, and people are increasingly insecure. America is now 20th in the world in ease of starting a business. Right. You know, because of all the... Uh, you can curse. The, this, is, yeah. this is a libertarian yeah, uh, yeah. area. You yeah, can yeah, curse. So, yeah. so it's, it's really... Um, so the system isn't working, but, but giving people the freedom to make judgments doesn't mean they will make the right judgments. Right. But in criminal sentencing, because what happened was by trying to take away discretion, mm -hmm. you actually ended up giving discretion to less trustworthy people, the prosecutors, mm -hmm. who would game the indictments to maximize the sentence under the rigid right. sentencing guidelines mm -hmm. so that they effectively had, could put a gun to the head even of an innocent mm -hmm. Defendant, because they're looking, they're staring they're, they're down looking the at a life sentence yeah. for some right. modest right. alleged crime yeah. because of the way the prosecutor organized mm -hmm. the indictment. Right. Well, who do we trust more? The prosecutor who's trying to make himself look good and has one interest, or a judge who at least is impartial. Right. And so, sure, judges will sometimes do the wrong things, and sometimes there's a way of dealing with that. Well, you, well, you talk about you know finding the sweet spot between you know uh, absolute discretion, which is kind of, which is tyranny of one form, yeah, unfettered or, discretion, yeah, or absolute rule, you know, right. being bound by rules, which is another form of tyranny. How do, how do we know when we're at that place? Um, you know, is is there a particular time in history that we should look at, or how do, how do we know that we're not fooling ourselves by giving government workers discretion? Well, I think it's, a, I actually see these as structural mm -hmm. points. Um, uh, I think law, talk about authority. Mm -hmm. No one should have unfettered authority to do whatever they want. I mean, and, and frankly, really no one does. I mean, you know, there's too many people around each decision. But, but, but the law for an official ought to have goals and principles. Mm -hmm. It's like a corral. And within that corral, the cop on the beat has the freedom to say, well, I'm not going to arrest that person for jaywalking because everyone in New York City jaywalks. Right. <laughs> you know, then we would, every, right. All of us would be in jail. Right. Um, I'm going to keep my focus on, on crimes that people think are more important, right. even though jaywalking is illegal. And so, and so within the corral, if you will, of, of an official's responsibility, the, the teacher ought to have responsibility the authority, in my view, to remove a, a disruptive student from the classroom immediately, mm -hmm. without any legal process, without having to prove its reasonableness. You know, you're not mm -hmm. sending the person to jail, you're sending them out of the classroom. But then there you, should be reviews so that if, sure. they're, if they're only sending out students of a particular right. race or a particular ethnicity or gender, Absolutely. or this or that. And so yeah. nobody should have unfettered discretion. Again, I said they're bounded right. by by, by principles and goals. So then who decides, mm -hmm. you know, what, whether they're adhering to the principles and goals? Well, there has to be someone else with authority mm -hmm. to use their judgment, an independent person, about whether this person is acting fairly or not. In the school, it might be a parent-teacher committee. You might have independent people. Right. Um, in, uh, um, for an inspector of a nursing home, mm -hmm. it's first the supervisor, uh, who could oversee it, but ultimately there's a court. If somebody's acting, trying to shut down a nursing home, you know, for the wrong reasons or because they didn't pay a bribe, mm -hmm. uh, we have a court system that says, well, that would be illegal. It's clearly unreasonable. It clearly exceeds the authority of the person, you know, to, right. to demand a bribe or, or indeed to act arbitrarily. So, so nobody should ever have unfettered discretion. We ought to maintain all these sort of checks and balances. But the critical point is the checks and balances also depend on judgment. Mm -hmm. There's no kind of automatic put the piece of paper in and the right, right answer pops up. Is that, um, you know, is, is that a particular kind of disease or, or uh, delusion of kind of post-war America? I mean, you know, of, of a kind of computer, you know, I'm thinking of like in the 1950s or right. 60s of like, 
Well, you know, you would you would see these geniuses with mainframe computers behind them with right. the wheels kind of, you know, and we have punch yeah, cards right, and, right. you know, it's scientific management. Right. And we're moving, we're, we're recognizing the limits of that model. Completely. Yeah. It's really completely. It's, it's interesting that, that, so I was talking with some senior people at Google about this. Um, software programs are built to be adaptable. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're actually the smart uh, programs and the algorithms they build into them are all extremely adaptable. They allow people to approach problems from different ways. Mm -hmm. They allow them to adjust to different other, other programs and systems. We've built a legal system that's completely rigid, right, right wrong, right? So it's, 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 it's binary in its ultimate sense. I mean, right. it's, it's either legal or illegal. And so we, we weigh everybody down with increasing numbers of these chains. Right and then wonder why nobody's getting anywhere. We can't rebuild a road or a bridge or, or maintain order, order in the classroom. Let's talk a little bit about how we change the current uh, system. In, the, in a chapter uh, titled Restoring Human Control of Democracy, you write, America is overdue for a shift in values, away from automatic government and toward a structure that allows humans to make choices needed to adapt to local needs and global challenges. My vision is this, overthrow the bureaucracy and return to a system based on human responsibility. That's a great slogan. I could see it in a uh, movie about the 60s uh, or the 70s right. or the 80s or the right. 90s. Or, you know, it could be at the Berlin Wall. It could be uh, at the beginning of Arab Spring. How do, we, how do we create a shift in human values, a shift in values away from automatic government and, and towards human choice? Well, um, ultimately, we have to convince the public right. that this vision of automatic government, which appeals to everybody, is dysfunctional, mm -hmm. that it's undermined their own freedom at the same time that it's made uh, government dysfunctional. And, that you and don't part of that is, first is, is popular. Obviously, this is the long conversation you've been having right. in your public life of, you know, that there is a system of government in place which relies on this kind of technocratic model and it doesn't work. It doesn't so, work. So we wanted to eliminate human choice. So you combine uh, this early industrial revolution notion of scientific management where everything is told, everybody's told how to do things. Right. You combine that, it didn't, it didn't work the way they thought right. it was going to work. But the idea and is you don't want the guy, you know, the third guy in a five-step assembly process suddenly freelancing and saying, oh, I'm going to start doing this. Absolutely. So right. there's, there's absolutely a role yeah. to organization. Right. And, and um, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. And then we come to the 1960s where we woke up to all these abuses. They were abuses, mm -hmm. racism, sexism, pollution, other things. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to create a system of government where no one would have the authority to make bad choices anymore. Mm -hmm. So you marry that idea with scientific management and you get this model of incredible micro-regulation mm -hmm. where all of a sudden rule books go from, a forest ranger used to have a little pamphlet with like 10 pages in it, what his guidelines were. They became thousands of pages. Right. And this coincided with, with our awakening that we needed more government oversight over things like pollution right. and other things. And so those rules started being written uh, in a kind of micro-regulatory way, telling everyone exactly how to do everything. Yeah, you liken it kind of to the Napoleonic Code, where it, you know, instead of a general principle, it seems like at every point you want to you imagine every possible permutation of every situation well, and have a rule. Well, actually, the, the, we can talk about that. Yeah. The, 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 the Napoleonic Code, looked at in hindsight, was a set of principles. Right. And, and was not, in most cases, mm -hmm. you know, a, a set of detailed rules. They purport, it purported to be clear law, right. quote, clear law. Right. But it relied on concepts like reasonableness and good faith, right. you know, just like, you know, generally law, law, law has to. And so we started this this uh, almost orgy of rule writing and, 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 and lawmaking. And whenever possible, we made law unequivocal mm -hmm. so there could be no judgment. So when the special ed laws were passed because there had been shameful abuse of disabled children, uh, it was passed in 1975, it gave um, a, uh, a right without any payment of each parent to an individualized education mm -hmm. for their child. Well, as that evolved, that right evolved over the decades, now special ed consumes over 25% of the total K-12 budget 
in this country for the tiny proportion of children, right. well less than 10%, who really need it. It's mm -hmm. been kind of overused. Um, and there's nothing for gifted children, almost nothing for pre-K education. Well, who's decided that 25% of the budget is the right balance between all these different educational needs? And the answer to that is nobody has. It just took a life of its own. It's like a runaway train. So apart from kind of publicizing this growth in automatic right. government and the deleterious effects, What's next? Then what are you? Because you talk about structural reforms. Right. I mean, this is not something you don't expect. You know, cancer to cure itself. Right. You don't expect a rotten right. government to fix itself. You know, the the Berlin Wall wasn't pulled down with the help of the germ. You know, the the GDR. Right. It was in spite right. of it. So, right. what are the structural reforms that will will you know follow a change in values that right. need to be right. put in Well, place? we need a new vision, and and the structural reform are a radical simplification of almost every area of government. It is beyond the capacity uh, of a legislature to do this. It violates the laws of legislative physics to, for right. a body of hundreds of people to, okay, so to, no, to, to, to no, negotiate that. This is not small ball. Like you can't, we're, gonna, we're not going to fix tax policy or anything by saying, OK, let's, let's tinker over right. here. Right. Um, is it, I mean, you, you talk about constitutional amendments. I'm not fully sure if you're kind of being slightly ironic or not, but what you're calling for is a kind of, we need to right. clear the decks. Right. History says that when, when societies need change, when the, when the inertial forces drive a society to a point where it's close to paralysis or dysfunction, the change is never small ball. Mm -hmm. It's always big. Sometimes it's bad big. Right. The French Revolution was not great. The Arab Spring has ended up in a being a kind of nightmare mm -hmm. so far. Uh, the American Revolution was great, mm -hmm. uh, but none of those things are, are, are small ball. Right. The, the advantage of what are known as recodifications, which have happened periodically through mm -hmm. history, like with, the, like with the Napoleonic Code, mm -hmm. like with the Uniform Commercial Code in the mm -hmm. 1950s. We took this mess of uh, commercial law in all the states and, and uh, turn them into a uniform commercial code that everybody, mm -hmm. so that everybody could contract with each other reasonably confident. What, what set the table for that? I mean, are there specific moments? Uh, you know, so for instance, at, at Reason, we talk a lot about the, uh, uh, the deregulation of interstate trucking and airline travel in, mm -hmm. the, uh, in the 70s, which was an interesting uh, coming together of people on the left, uh, you know, Ralph Nader and Ted Kennedy, along with right-wing uh, economists. Um, what happened that the Universal Commercial Code was able to happen? Well, you had uh, business interests mm -hmm. saying uh, having a dis discombobulated contract mm -hmm. law was standing in the way of progress. Mm -hmm. And then you had labor groups also saying this is standing in the way of jobs and, and, and progress. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you were able to get coalitions mm -hmm. of people, including leading uh, contract law experts, mm -hmm. Everyone saw that having a kind of jungle, you know, kind of an Amazonian yeah. jungle for contract law made no sense. It needed to be clear and understandable. Mm -hmm. So they came together to fix it. What's needed today is a similar understanding that a much bigger Amazonian right. jungle of bureaucracy that we've built up over the last 50 years mainly has a similar effect. It's paralyzing the society and it's in everyone's interest except perhaps for isolated special interests. Well, and, or, or large the, 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 their speaker or their uh, agents in, the, in Congress say, I mean, you write, the odds are about zero that the Democratic Party will abandon, say, the perquisites of public employees unions. The odds are also low that the Republican Party will accept the need for a more flexible government. So, you know, you, you talk, say, for instance, in, in the set of amendments that you suggest as a way of clearing the thicket, uh, things like the president would actually be given more control over the executive branch, uh, hiring and firing decisions, right. setting agendas. Right. Um, you know, how will that happen? It will only happen when there's a when there's public demand. Mm -hmm. And so the the Washington Washington works perfectly well on its own terms. It's, un it's inside a bubble, mold has grown over it. Right. The mold are all these special interests and, and the money that goes back and forth and there's a tug of war that keeps everybody employed and nothing much changes. Right. So why do they want to put their jobs at risk, whoever they are, mm -hmm. 
you know, by actually going to a better system. It's never going to happen right. until we actually put outside pressure to disrupt it. That's and you, you talk about that there's a, you know, this is the, the need for reform is actually a moral imperative for citizens, not for politicians. Yeah, right, right. And so um, we, the citizenry, have gotten used to, and it probably get some pleasure out of schadenfreude, you know, out of how stupid government works. Right. Thank God we don't work for government. Yeah. You know, look at how bad they are. The problem is it's now affecting our lives. We can't start our business. I can't, our kids can't even have a lemonade stand. Mm -hmm. You know, there's right. uh, the teacher can't maintain order in the classroom. It's affecting us everywhere. And our taxes are going up and our kids are going to go bankrupt because of the money we're spending on Medicare. Do you, um, I mean, are you favorably exposed then towards groups like the Tea Party, which seem to be shaking things up? And you may not agree with their right. agenda, however mm -hmm. that we define that. But, I mean, is that the type well, of well, outside e energy that needs to be directed? Well, yes, that energy is very constructive. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, you know, my, um, my quibble with the Tea Party is that they think the answer is to get rid of government altogether. Mm -hmm. And I agree and argue here that basically every government program is right. broken. But uh, while there are some we certainly ought to get rid of, you know, all these subsidies from the New Deal and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, you do want oversight over nursing homes. You do mm -hmm. want, you know, oversight over worker safety. But those programs are incredibly ineffective for the right. reasons I stated. And, and costly and inexpensive and get in the way of people doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the, uh, the questions for a working government and society are, do people feel free to do what's right? Can, mm -hmm. can government officials be practical? Can they balance a budget? Can they, can they be fair? It doesn't guarantee they will be. Do you, I mean, is part of the problem, you know, you're obviously, we're in a nice neighborhood in New York right. where we're talking, uh, you're doing extremely well and have, you know, things are hard for you. I mean, you, you might be in a position to start a business, but you can also, you can kind of create a walled garden and you can right. throw as much money as you need over the wall to evacuate right. government. You don't have to send your kids to the local school. Right. You don't have to send your parents to a, a public nursing home or anything like that is, you know, is it that people are now able, and more and more people are able to evacuate government and government services, and so the pressure that would build if we were all in this together is, is just not gonna be there? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think that the people who have the resources to, uh, to, to be more effective as advocates for change don't have, don't have the imperative for change. I mean, you know, one day a few months ago, a friend of mine came up to me, a very successful businessman, saying, gosh, you know, that editorial you wrote in the Wall Street Journal is just great. It's just great that you're doing this. And I said uh, to him, well, great. Well, you should get involved and help. He said, nah, it's hopeless, you know. <laughs> and so, so that's a, you know, that's, to me, that's actually immoral. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I argue in the book is that uh, the solutions here, I actually don't think are that hard conceptually. It is not hard to come up with a model for environmental review where it takes a year or two, not a decade mm -hmm. or two. Germany does it that right. way, Canada does it that way. Really easy, you give some I mean, official uh, the authority to make decide when's enough's enough and you, and you make it happen. I could, with the possible exception of healthcare because mm -hmm. again, this infinite demand and right. no market mechanism, Every other program is actually really easy to fix. You simplify it, you, you, know, you make it go Well, and you forward. talk, I mean, one of the, the truly obvious and simple rules that you suggest in, in your list of amendments is that any law with a budgetary impact would be sunsetted in 15 years. So it yeah. has to come up for review. Yes, it has Those to seems... come up because government, our founders actually made a mistake there. You know, there was this big debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, and the Anti-Federalists wanted to prevent the federal government from taking over state you know, mm -hmm. state decisions. So they made it very hard to pass federal laws with all the checks and balances. Fine, except 200 years later, now you've got all this sediment in the harbor, so nobody can get anywhere, all this law, and the same checks and balances apply to get rid of a law, getting rid right. of a law as, it, as to pass right. it in the first place, except that now the law has an army of special interests around it. Every single law. Like the special ed law, it's, got a, it's not money, it's these special ed advocates who are zealots. They'll chain mm -hmm. themselves to your door. Uh, so, so no one can actually get rid of a law. It's, it's so in, 
uh, it's so unlikely, it's so difficult right. to actually amend the law in any significant way that nobody even thinks about it. Congress doesn't even know it's their job anymore. Right. Hmm. Well, who else's job it is? You know, all this law, probably, who's in charge of whether it works or not? None of it works. Who's in charge? Nobody. Yeah. So, so we have a constitutional problem, and so I propose a sunset clause where every law with budgetary impact will sunset every 15 years, and to avoid Congress just giving lip service and reenacting it, which has been the experience in some states with right. sunset laws, make it constitutional and give an independent commission the job of actually mm. just recommending what to do about it mm -hmm. and having that be presented to the public before Congress can then act right. again. So it has a bogey against yeah. which it has to act because otherwise... But again, it is, I mean, on a certain level, I mean, there needs to be structural reforms, but in the right. end, it really depends on the will of the citizenry to say, you right. know what, enough is enough, or we share a vision of a limited government, uh, you know, that is accountable. Right. Right. Uh, talk a little bit in terms of, um, uh, you know, how people help and whatnot. You're the uh, president uh, or chair of the Common Good Foundation. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Well, um it's very important, as I argue in the book, that citizens get involved. And your point is that nothing's going to change, and if it does change, nothing's still going to work well unless citizens actually take ownership for these issues and feel like it's their job to help make democracy work. And now we've got a kind of absentee government where, where the citizens acquiesce in it and feel like it's out of their control, and it is largely out of their control. I mean, it's fascinating, the budget, uh, just the federal budget, about two-thirds of it is fully is what's called mandatory spending, which is on autopilot, and then even a lot of discretionary spending is on autopilot. Yeah, yeah it's, it's um, public solvency is illegal. Mm -hmm. It's often pre-said yeah. in legal concrete. Right. You know, is it, I mean, basically doing anything sensible is illegal. Right. Because it's all, it's all been, you know, pre-said in law. Right. So, so citizens have to get involved both in making this happen and in making sure it will continue to happen. Our founders knew that. I mean, you know, Benjamin Franklin said, what have you done? He said, well, we've created a republic if you can keep it. Right. And in, in what he was saying is that citizens have to be involved. So we actually need to create new institutions, mm -hmm. citizen institutions that are not designed to take power, but to put pressure on those in power to make sure they actually are doing their jobs. And the, those institutions yeah. don't exist. How, uh, how does the common good fit into that? Vision? Well, the common good is, is uh, what we've been doing, we've been in business a dozen years, uh, we create new visions for how law could actually work better. We had a joint venture with the Harvard School of Public Health to design a new system of justice for healthcare, basically to solve the medical malpractice problem where we waste you know, $100 billion a year in defensive medicine because doctors mm -hmm. unreasonably, they reasonably don't trust the system of justice because right. it's just jury by jury. So we would create a system of expert health courts. And then we built a coalition behind it. Everybody's for it. Romney's for it. Obama came out for yeah. it. All the debt commissions. The trial lawyers have stopped it so far, but it will happen. Hmm. Uh, now we're redesigning the infrastructure approval process. And if we could get that passed, we have a couple of potential sponsors in the Senate, uh, in the next uh, year or two, we could hire two million Americans. Mm -hmm. of do, doing infrastructure over the next four or five years mm -hmm. just by changing, by simplifying the infrastructure mm -hmm. approval process. So we're in the business of creating new visions. But what's needed now, and I argue in this book, is the big new vision. Mm -hmm. You know, not the new vision of just fixing this or that, but a new vision about how government could work. So uh, what I'm, my ambition for this book is that um, other groups, allied groups, uh, including people who run the Reason Foundation, mm -hmm. will, will find common cause in the need for big change. And we'll come together in a kind of a coalition of the whole and say, we may not agree on what every solution is, but what we can all agree is this system of government is really out of control. We'll end with, uh, you know, take the facts and put them into your computer. Uh, what are the, what's the probability that big change will happen over the next five years? Uh, I think the probability that big change will happen over the next 10 years is extremely high. Um, is that 20 percent? Is that 80 percent? Is it? Yeah, uh, it's 75 percent. Okay. And, and, and the reason big change will happen is not because of what I do or you do or anybody else does. 
The reason it'll happen is because we'll have a crisis mm -hmm. and the current system is truly unsustainable. And, um, and but what's important when you have a crisis because you don't want to end it, have it end up like the French Revolution. Right. You don't want Occupy Wall Street to be in charge. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is it very important to have a new vision. Mm -hmm. And if you have a new vision, then maybe you'll get leaders. I'm talking to uh, former Governor Mitch Daniels mm -hmm. about creating a new center at Purdue mm -hmm. where we would actually begin building a vision block by block and go through government programs and analyze how they don't work and come up with models of how right. they might work. And, yeah. And begin to well, and so this is the, I believe it was Milton Friedman who said that, you know, the goal of people who trade in ideas and, and public policy is to make things that seem politically inevitable become, or rather politically impossible, become politically inevitable. Because when the crisis right. comes, people will be looking around right. for, okay, will this work? Will this work? Will right. This work? right. And, so, and so what I'm arguing for ultimately here is is a structure of government of the sort that our founders contemplated, mm -hmm. where leaders are elected, they take responsibility, they actually act on their values, they don't try to avoid their values, they act on their values, because that's what we elected them mm -hmm. for, and they succeed or fail, and they're held accountable. And, and the, the model, all of life works on responsibility. Everybody looking, listening to this program has achieved what they've achieved in life, because they took responsibility to make it happen. Government's no different than that. Somebody's got to take responsibility. They'll fall down, they can be held accountable, they'll pick themselves up, or somebody else will take their place. And if you can't be practical, you can't be fair, you can't be moral, and you can't balance a budget. And that's where we are right now in this state, which means we're going to have to rebuild it. Well, we will leave it there. The book, the new book by Philip K. Howard is The Rule of Nobody, Saving America from Dead Laws and Broken Government. Thanks for talking with us. Thanks, Nick. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.